Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, January 20th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a financial advisor. I cannot give you individual investment advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, let's get into it. So just economic tidbits for the week. Uh, they continue to, continues to come in very, very negative. And again, I think that we may already be in a recession. Again, these things are always uh, classified after the fact. The one thing I will say is the ex um, uh, job uh, or what do they call it? layoffs or whatever, I mean, the job situation is still pretty good. But again, as I've pointed out in the past, this is a lagging indicator. They, this is going to be the last thing that rolls over. And when it does, it usually rolls over hard. Go back and look at the uh, previous times that unemployment spiked in the economy during recessions, which I probably should have just put the chart up here, but you can go to the St. Louis Fred website, look up uh, unemployment rate, drag it out for... Uh, um, for decades, and you'll see that once it does turn up, it, it, it goes up pretty quick. So we'll see. Uh, here's something, you know, we're making records now, right? So this is a, another record. Uh, existing home sales in the U.S. hitting nearly three-decade low. Uh, this was from a U.S. Today, USA Today article. The National Association of Realtors said Friday that just over 4 million homes were sold in the U.S. in 2023. The last time sales fell below 4.1 million, another Democratic president was in the White House. Uh, I didn't put that part in there, but it wasn't Obama, it was Clinton. So it's been a, several several decades, right? A couple decades since we've had this low of existing home sales in the U.S. And obviously the population and the economy is much larger now. Anyway, the Fed stopped aggressively raising short-term interest rates this past summer. By then, mortgage rates more than doubled and approached 8% in October. Higher rates, in turn, increased monthly payments for new homeowners. In most markets, home prices have continued to increase, too. Well, they certainly haven't come down. They are starting to come down in some areas, though. You know, the problem is, is that a lot of folks, well, I would say it's a problem. Just facts are that a lot of people locked in very low interest rates, you know, 3%, they, re, they refinanced, everybody refinanced 3, 3.25. So it doesn't make sense to sell your house or it's not, people aren't choosing to make the economic decision to sell their house with a 3.25% mortgage and then have to go buy a new house with a, you know, 7.5% mortgage and with these high real estate prices. So we haven't seen prices come down like they need to. Uh, I think that's going to happen, right? We need to see once employment cracks and people can't make their mortgage payments because people live paycheck to paycheck, a lot, a lot of folks, um, people are going to get in distress very quickly. Uh, it goes on here, the National Association of Realtors found this fall that U.S. homes haven't been this unaffordable since Ronald Reagan's presidency when 30-year mortgage rates hovered around 14%. The mix of higher prices and more expensive monthly mortgages fed this steep decline. Um, yeah, this is another thing that, you know, regardless of what the administration says, the regime in D.C. or the media tells you everything isn't wonderful. You know, you can't take that new job in that other state because you can't you don't want to sell your house and then have to buy a more an ex, as expensive or more expensive house with a higher mortgage interest rate, you know, your payments will double. And so that's why, you know, that's, that's another thing that's happening. So people, this is just another factor that's aggravating people. Um, game of trades, good charts. Trucking employment is falling, a warning. You see the previous times that there were recessions. You saw what happened to truck transportation uh, employment. It falls off a cliff along with uh, all private sector um, employment. So, 
you see in blue when it's expanding or not really dropping like in a recession during these red periods or the recessions, but you see what's happening, right? Um, it's collapsing and uh, there's a little squiggle here. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll recover. Maybe we are going to have recovery. You know, what I tell the people that are bullish on the economy is show me with the exception of the free money that the Fed, federal government's giving, what's the growth in the economy? What's going to sustain it? You know, all of the abatements, all of the people, free money that was going directly to people's accounts, that's dried up. People have to pay their mortgages now. People have to pay their rents. People can't, you know, people need to pay their college uh, loans. So a lot of things have changed, right? And so the free money era is over. And so now economic reality is starting to dawn. So we'll have to continue to watch this. This is something that also like Stan Druckenmiller watches quite quite uh, closely. Empire State Manufacturing Survey, lowest since the pandemic. Business activity dropped sharply in New York State, according to firms responding to the January 2024 Empire State Manufacturing Survey. The headline general business condition Conditions Index fell 29 points to negative 43.7, its lowest reading since May 2020. You can see the chart. You see the previous recessionary periods. You see that we are at levels that are consistent with what we saw during the pandemic shutdown and going all the way back to the great financial crisis. We have exceeded the decline of the, gener of the great financial crisis, and yet everything's fine. So we'll see. We'll see if that's, in fact, the case. You know, the thing about employment's interesting, as we I talked about it last week or the week before. You see these initial numbers come out. They talk about it on Bloomberg and on CNBC. Everything's wonderful. And then, you know, a month later, the Bureau of Labor Statistics comes in and readjusts the number. It's not as uh, optimistic as it was, but that doesn't get reported. Just the headline and so if you're hanging your hat on the BLS employment um, stuff weekly as saying that that's proving the economy is an expansion or doing fine, you're nuts. This economy is, we're at great financial crisis lows here. We're exceeding that. There's no squiggle in this. Now, this is one indicator again. We don't want to fixate on one indicator, but, you know, trucking, Empire State, PMIs, I mean, Momentum is building to the argument that we are not only not going to have a soft landing, we're going to have a hard, hard landing. Office vacancy rate, record 19.6% from the Kobiesi letter. Another person outfit that I follow on Twitter. Lots of good info. The office, office vacancy rate in the U.S. jumped to a record 19.6% in Q4 2023. This marks the largest quarterly increase since Q1 2021 and a higher vacancy rate than the previous record of 19.3%. Again, we're setting more records here, not good ones either. As a result, new office construction just hit its lowest level since 2012. Office building prices in the US are currently down 40% from the highs. Commercial real estate is beyond bear market territory. I just got done putting together the free email that will go out uh, Sunday. And one of the things I put in there is I didn't realize this, but it was pointed out to me by someone else. Last Sunday, 60 Minutes did a pretty good uh, report on, it's like a 15 minute report you know, that they do. Uh, it was about commercial real estate, specific to New York City, but kind of a symptomatic of what's happening around the whole country. And the same thing, you know, talking about all the problems there. Uh, again, if you if you want to get those free emails from me, uh, you know, I moved that whole thing over to Substack. You know, I have the free emails that go out that have a lot of good information in them. Obviously, they're at a higher level. I don't get into specifics uh, like I do in the paid newsletter, but that is a good introductory um, introduction into the writing and, and, and the research that I do for the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter, but there'll be a link to the video in there. So sign up for that if you're not a, uh, uh, getting that. Uh, and there's a lot of good stuff in there uh, every week. I think you'll find that people that uh, 
uh, get it. Uh, you know, we don't spam you. We just send that out once a week and you can, you can, it's free. So why not? But this again, more bad, more bad news. You know, one of the things uh, I was reading um, and I get that Steve Blumenthal's on, on my radar uh, CMG group, I think is who the guy works for. You can get these free emails from him. I've been taking his letter for years, lots of good stuff in there too. And he, he dive, he really does a deep dive into this where some folks he's talking to, you know, this could be the catalyst for the next banking crisis. And, and if you recall, you know, I didn't know, I had been speculating on what could be the catalyst for the next crisis, right? The next catalyst for the, this reliquification that we're going to need in the U.S. Um, next banking crisis, what have you? And I said that commercial real estate could be uh, that catalyst, but we'll see. Uh, I think the can kicking uh, in the 60 Minutes video, one of the people that they big time, big shot uh, commercial real estate investor said that you know you can kick the can when interest rates were low. They could kick the can, kick the problem down the road. But now that they've raised rates like they have, you can't do that. So the reckoning is coming, and they're talking about somewhere around eight hundred billion to a trillion dollars, right? And most of this is on the balance sheets of regional banks. So we could quite possibly be looking at another banking crisis. Remains to be seen. Another record that was set this week. Uh, we're now at thirty-four trillion dollars in federal debt. Again, as I've said before, I, I, this is not going to get fixed. You're going to have to have a crisis. I've said before, it's 2024. Um, I think that we'll probably see a $50 trillion in debt by the end of this decade. Um, I think you'll have $30, $40 trillion on the Fed's balance sheet. The dollar is going to get roasted. Um, if you don't, if you want to argue with me, then tell me how they, where's the spending cuts? Where are the spending cuts? They're talking about spending more money now. OK, we need to spend more money on defense because we have all these wars going on now and we haven't even cranked it up with China yet. OK, we'll get into that later, but there's, there's no constituency anywhere for cutting spending. Rand Paul, he's the only one that talks about it. Not that much anymore either, I noticed. We'll see. One thing that was interesting, though, is with, you know, the rate cut expectations are receding now. You know, originally, um, they're down to like five. Originally, I think late last year, the consensus view was around seven, right? Rate cuts for 2024. Now we're looking at five. And it's all back to, you know, we get these decent retail sales numbers or, you know, the market wants to focus on these things, right? And that's what it's doing. I mean, I think the S&P made a new high today, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I don't watch it day to day, but, you know, stocks are rallying. And because everything's wonderful, but I'm showing you that the rot in the foundation is there. And so, again, you can get into this batting statistics back and forth at each other, but I just don't see what the growth impetus is for the U.S. economy. And I think that, you know, yes, it's a presidential election year, so they're going to pull out all the stops, but I mean, is it going to be enough? We'll see. Or is it that we end up, you know, this time next year, we're in the middle of QE and massive rate cuts, right? Because the economy rolled over and is heading for a hard landing. So Game of Trades, again, this is a good chart that he that he made. This is uh, talking about uranium miners not making enough uranium. So you have, this is the production of uranium in tons, right, in the gray for each year. And then what I found interesting is, is this is the share of world demand that was met, okay? So you can see that the last three years, well, we don't even have 2023 on here, but, you know, we're, we're 75, you know, we're not even close to being meeting world demand, right? And the share of production is going down, and this is kind of a good segue. I like this chart because it kind of shows you, okay, people say, well, uranium production, mine production is down, you know, 50, you're at 60,000 tons or whatever, it dropped to 50,000. What does that really mean? But when you look at the share of world demand met and it's consistently dropped, 
over the last decade, uh, or last eight years, again, you see the problem that we have, right? We don't have enough material and everybody gets that. It's just very opaque. You know, what if you had only met 75% of world oil demand at 100 million barrels a day? I mean, the oil price would be $500 a barrel. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that obviously this doesn't, I don't think, account for secondary supply and some other things. This gives you just a general uh, view that mining production is not, is not cut in the mustard. And again, this is solvable, but it's going to take billions of dollars of investment, and it's going to take years. It's not something that's going to get fixed in a year or two. Now, I find interesting is now we've seen um, ISR mines turning back on in the U.S. here. Encore here in Texas got their mine going in South Texas. I think uh, they're going to have a, a gathering out there in February. Maybe I should see if I could get in that and drive out there. It's somewhere down uh, by Kingsville somewhere, which isn't too far from my house, maybe an hour drive. Uh, I do own a few shares, so maybe they'll let a shareholder out there. That'd be kind of interesting. Um, I do know that UEC is talking about restarting a mine. Um, Peninsula, I think, is another one. So this is like a million or under, a little bit under a million pounds a year. That ain't going to get it done. Yes, it's incremental supply. Yes, those companies will uh, make some hay. Uh, but, it, you know, we need to see that aero mine come on that NextGen has. It's 30 million pounds a year, right? But that's, you know, that's years away. They don't even have their federal permit yet. And then you're talking how long to build the mine? Eight years? Ten years? What kind of issues are they going to have during that time? So we'll see. Again, there's not a shortage of uranium in the Earth's crust. There's a shortage of capital currently. So Trader Ferg, uh, we've, you know, I wouldn't say we're like friends because we just are acquaintances, but we've talked before uh, several times, interviewed each other. I didn't realize he was on Substack now, but he has an article that's pretty good where he is uh, skeptical of this acid excuse that Kaz Adamprom had. And uh, this is just a couple of blurbs. I put a, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. You can go check it out. Uh, it's a paid article, but he gives a, you know, a, quite a bit of the article away free to set the stage. And uh, he seems to be skeptical of the whole uh, acid excuse. Basically, he says here, uh, he has some charts and some tables, which are pretty interesting to take a look at. It says, in hunting out this table, I found this piece I wrote back in 2019, Digging into Assumptions where I expanded on why I thought Kaz Adamprom was going to struggle ever to hit these numbers. If you don't have time to read it, the quick summary is Kaz Adamprom having been overstating their extraction rates, understating coming declines. Um, and so that appears that could be a, a pre pretty big possibility. Uh, you gotta remember something, Kaz Adamprom is, yes, it trades some of like five or 10% of the stock trades you know, but it's a state entity, right? Of the, you know, of of the of Kazakhstan. So this is a former Soviet republic. So you, you can see where I'm going with this. Uh, you're not going to necessarily have the best shareholder friendly and forthrightness. That's just not how things are done in those countries. So we could be in a situation where the world's largest producer uh, could have quite possibly been overstating its production, understating its decline rates. Um, not doing things properly, not managing its resource properly. Who knows what they've done? I don't think you're ever going to know. But uh, long story short, they haven't hit their subsoil, uh, you know, agreement, what they're allowed to produce since 2017, I think. And so they're not going to hit them this year. And we're in the middle of a supply crisis. You know, not only that, Cameco has had problems you know, delivering uh, the material they need to deliver. They've had issues with some of their mines. Same issues that we've talked about before, right? Supply issues, labor issues, all kinds of issues. That's what I said before, mining's a tough business. He goes on to say, understanding all of this meant I am pretty skeptical of this excuse for missing 24 and 25 targets. Kaz Adam Prom expects adjustments to its 2024 production plan. I believe they have a conference call 
that them being Cavs at Prom like the first week of February. So this will be interesting. Um, I think they're in big trouble. I don't know exactly why or what's going on. It's obvious there's some kind of big trouble there. And one of the reasons that I think that, and I think it's when it, if it comes out, this could be the catalyst that takes us up to two or $300 a pound. Why? Uh, somebody put this on Twitter. It's like, these are the executive departures, C-suite departures since 2020 at Kaz Adam Prom. Look at all these people, CEO, board member, chief commercial officer, director of legal, CFO, chief commercial officer, CEO and board member. I mean, that's two CEOs in, you know, a year and a half. Um, chief operating officer, chief operating officer, CEO, chief operating officer. This is all going back to 2020, November, right? So in basically three years, you've had three and a half years, whatever, multiple CFOs, multiple COOs, multiple CEOs, board members, everybody, you know, you know, what's going on over there? You know, I put it here sarcastically, check the glass door reviews. Did they take all the free uh, breakfast bars and coffee out of the break room? What's going on at Kaz Adam Prom in the C-suite? You know, is this like, hey, I get in here, I see what's under the carpet and I get out of Dodge. You know, you got a meteor head heading for the uh, Kaz Adam Prom corporate offices. Um, what's going on over there? And, you know, if this is accurate, you know, resign, not people getting fired. I was like one guy that retired, chief nuclear fuel cycle officer retired. The rest of these people got out of Dodge and some of them weren't there long, right? I mean, you had this one CEO uh, leave in July 2022, and the next one left uh, 14 months later. Yeah, something like that. S something's not right. I mean, I don't know when he got hired. How long does it take to find a new CEO? I mean, these people are, it's like, rotate. this isn't what you would expect to see at a company that's squared away. So something's not right here. Um, and maybe it's like, Hey, I get in there, I see what's really going on. And I'm, I don't want to be the, I don't want to be the guy holding the flaming bag of dog crap. Right. So we could have a real big problem here, folks, which will be to our benefit as, uh, in, uh, speculators or investors in uranium, uh, regardless, uh, something's not right. And so you can speculate all you want. We, I don't, like I said, we're not going to know. I think there's going to be a lot of interest in this meeting the first week of February. Speaking of failing to meet production goals, uh, you have tech resources, which is a big copper miner. They divested themselves of like all their coal assets and focused on copper. They say their 2023 20, copper production fell short of guidance. Tech Resources says its copper production for 2023 fell short of its guidance for the year, while its zinc production also came in slightly below expectations. The Vancouver-based miner says copper production for 2023 totaled 296,000 tons as it faced a slower ramp-up of its QB2 project, as well as a localized geotechnical fault at its Highland Valley Copper operations in August. The company's guidance for 2023 had been between 320 and 365. So they, they, they missed pretty big. That's a big miss, right? Over, you know, 10% or something like that, right? So um, this is what I've said before, folks. This commodity super cycle that we are in now that's going to manifest over this decade is not going to be necessarily a demand-driven one like the previous one when China had its coming out party. This is going to be, we are in a world of supply constraints now and underinvestment. And then when you have that, right, when you already have those built in because of the lack of investment over a decade, then things like this that you normally wouldn't pay attention to if supply was sufficient coming online, uh, when you're supply constrained, you know, these are things at the margin that can affect prices. And so, you know, you shut down a major copper mine in Panama, for socio reasons, political reasons. You have various copper miners missing um, production. It all adds up to higher prices. So then we have uh, gold and copper production dips at Barrick. You know, Barrick is not only a big gold producer, but they are also a very large copper producer. And so they said that they produced 405 million ounces of gold in 2023, down 2% from the 404.14 million ounces produced in 22. Copper dipped too, 
420 million pounds in 2023 compared to 440 million pounds in 2022. Barrick noted that both copper and gold production was within its guidance. Gold production was also up for the Q4 compared to Q3. The bottom line is, is that, you know, I don't show these things in isolation. We're noticing a trend week after week. We're reporting out, you know, I'm not seeing a lot of reports of people hitting their mark or exceeding it. And we've talked about what the requirements will be for the energy transition that the masters of the universe are planning for everyone and nobody knows where they're going to get the resources. So something to keep in mind, this is, you know, just more evidence for what I think, like I said before, is going to be uh, a supply driven super cycling resource. Um, here we go here. This is a, uh, Energy tidbits. This is a free thing that comes out. This is off of Twitter. Um, but I get this. You can get this in your email. If you go to Twitter, look this guy up, and then you can sign up. And they send it out uh, every week. It's got like 20 or 30 pages of energy news. But anyways, they also send out tweets. But I like this. Breaking Ford Cuts F-150 Lightning Production to, quote, achieve optimal balance of production, sales growth, and profitability, unquote. Yeah, nobody wants these things. You know, yes, there's uh, wealthy people or tech geeks that, you know, I want to drive an electric car, but the average person wants convenience. And after this Arctic blast that we've had the last week, uh, you know, do you really want to be driving around in Minnesota or Alberta or, you know, Western New York in a Tesla and have, you know, or, you know, and have the battery run down on you? So, I, like I said, I think that the masters of the universe want to force the electric cars on everybody. I'm not sure everybody wants to buy one. And so we'll see how it goes. Um, again, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, if, the, if, the, if they use some kind of command economy and force internal combustion engines off the road, uh, then I can see that happening. But, you know, we, we, we are going back or at least I'm talking, going back to talk about what I have dubbed anyways, you know, not only the fact that we're going to have a commodity super cycle that's exacerbated by underinvestment, but also the political upheavals and social upheavals that we're going to see over the next decade. Okay. You have the United States now we're in three wars. Okay. We shouldn't be involved in any of them, but we are. Uh, two of them are intertwined with this deal in Gaza and then the ongoing debacle in Ukraine. And now you have a situation where you have crazy people in Europe talking about passing laws in Poland that if you get called up for military service, you have six hours to report or, you know, you're going to prison for five years. And, you know, people in Sweden being told, you know, they just had to join NATO, right? They had been neutral for all those years, all through World War II. Nobody invaded them, you know, whatever. Didn't want to be neutral anymore. Wanted to join NATO. And now, you know, prepare for a war with Russia. You know, the UK, this little pipsqueak, the UK that thinks there's still, this is like 1820 or something, and there's still a world power, uh, telling their populace that expect a war with Russia in the next 20 years. Okay. And so, you know, <laughs> ongoing political turmoil and upheaval with farmers uh, protesting in Germany, France, the Netherlands, Poland, okay? Ongoing uncontrolled immigration from North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa into Europe, okay? Um, just economic malaise, no new ideas. And then the goofball WEF uh, conference this week where it's just like, just keep doing what we're doing. I mean, people are going to be pushed to the brink. And so um, we shall see. Now, this is going to aggravate some people, but this is just uh, what happened. I mean, Trump dominated in Iowa, okay? Uh, we're, we're still, like, a long way out from the election. But I will point out a couple things. Uh, basically, Trump's going to be the nominee for the Republican Party. Um, that's just going to happen. Um, this is the prediction markets. Uh, this is subject to change, obviously. I shouldn't say it's 100% because nothing's 100%. He could die. They're going to try to put him in jail. They're going to pull out all the stops to keep this guy from uh, being on the ballot against sleepy Joe Biden. 
who, by the way, now is at a 32% approval rating. So if the economy is so wonderful and Bidenomics is working and we're just you know progressing to a new era, uh, why is this guy at 32% approval rating? And you know <laughs> what happens if by the summer we're in a hard landing and everybody's acknowledging it? There won't be enough time to to to, to pull out of it. And so yeah, there's going to be a lot of volatility this year and going forward politically socially economically geopolitically i mean it's going to present a lot of opportunity for speculators i don't get worried about it i don't get angst about it why there's always going to be wars and rumors of wars okay um i can't i'm not king of the world i can't you know affect any of these things but what i can do is understand what's happening hopefully bring the news to you, analyze it in a proper way and find ways to take advantage of it so that we can get through it and get our families through it. That's my goal. And so this is interesting. We'll see what happens in Tuesday in New Hampshire, but the Republican primary could be over next week. So we'll see what happens and we'll see if, uh, you know, if Mr. Biden actually is going to be the nominee, you know, there's all these machinations going on at the DNC, you know, that's, you want to talk about uh, political machines. I give them credit, you know, they, they play for keeps at the DNC and they really don't care about people's feelings or protocol. Uh, when they, they know this guy cannot beat Trump's one-on-one. -on -one, okay. The guy, it cannot, he's not going to be able to hide in his basement this time. Okay. And so all kinds of things could happen. He could retire. He could leave for health reasons. They could have some kind of plan to install, you know, they want to try to get Gavin Newsom in there. I don't know how that's going to run when California has a $68 billion funding deficit this year uh, because of the way that place has been run into the ground and they're proposing a wealth tax or, you know, this do us ex machina plan of bringing in Michelle Obama. We'll see. Uh, like I said, there's going to be a lot of volatility. You know, Trump, I think is probably going to beat the, uh, Fannie Willis, Georgia case, just because Fannie Willis, this DA, corrupt DA, was using public funds for her boyfriend, I don't know, goofy stuff that goes on. Um, so we'll see, you know, uh, who knows if they can put him in jail, he could still, you know, can he still run for office? What happens if he gets elected and, he, and he's actually in prison? I don't know. So it's just a lot of weird stuff setting up for 2024. Uh, and Markets don't like weird stuff. They don't like uncertainty. And uh, we're going to have a lot of that this year. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.